Welcome to the weekly live broadcast of Gnostic Radio, a free public service from Telema Press. Each Saturday, Gnostic Radio broadcasts free lectures from the Gnostic tradition of Samael on Vior. Gnosis is the essential wisdom from which all religions have been born. Gnosis is the universal doctrine containing the precise science to free the soul from suffering. Each lecture explores another aspect of this timeless and sacred knowledge. Listeners are encouraged to participate in the live chat session via AOL's instant messaging software, available for free on the web. Simply download and install this software and send a message to Gnostic School in order to be included in the chat session. Participants are able to send in questions about the lecture, which will be answered in the broadcast. Participation is free and completely anonymous. For more information about Gnosis, these lectures, or how to install the AOL software, you can visit the website of Telema Press at www.gnosis-usa.com. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of all suffering, we present today's lecture. May all beings be happy. Good morning. We're going to begin our lecture continuing in our exploration, our sort of circuitous exploration of the Eightfold Path. Of course, anyone who studied Buddhism knows well that the Eightfold Path is one of the fundamental aspects of the teachings that the Buddha Shakyamuni gave to humanity. One of his first teachings was the Four Noble Truths. And in these Four Noble Truths, some very fundamental aspects of life are defined. And these aspects, of course, revolve around the nature of suffering. The Fourth Noble Truth expresses that there is a, a way or a path to overcome suffering, to escape suffering. And that fourth truth is further clarified by the exposition of the Eightfold Path. And of course, the Eightfold Path provides a basic outline or basic structure of fundamental foundations upon which any aspirant has to work. And we've been talking about those for a number of weeks. Right effort, right action, right livelihood. And those eights are divided, of course, into three broad categories. View, action, and meditation. The synthesis of them all or the point at which they all begin, of course, lies within oneself. To really apply and understand the Eightfold Path, or in other words, the steps to walk out of suffering, we have to learn how to make those aspects, of those steps, practical. And they have to begin in ourselves. To merely grasp the intellectual understanding or to have a mental image of the structure of the path is insufficient. We need that. We need to have an intellectual grasp of the work, and we need to have an intellectual grasp of the structure. But truly the work does not begin until that information, that understanding, moves beyond the intellect and becomes something practical. Another way of examining that same, same idea 
is that when we take an understanding into the intellect, we build a mental picture or a mental formation, a structure in the mind. And it's easy for us to stop there and to make the assumption that a mental picture or a mental understanding is sufficient. But of course, in Gnosis, we know that that is not the case. The very term Gnosis means direct experience or direct knowledge. It's something personal, something that we acquire through our own efforts. In truth, all of the great religions seek that same goal. They seek the direct experience of the truths that they express. But unfortunately, because of the nature of our mind, we often fall short of acquiring that direct experience. And we rest instead in mere belief or intellectual understanding. So in order for us to really make sense of the Eightfold Path, in order for us to experience that Eightfold Path, there's one of those eight steps that we have to apply. And without it, the experience of that path remains elusive, impossible. And that step, that essential step, unavoidable step, <clears throat> is right mindfulness. You can make all the right effort you want. You can meditate. You can acquire a great intellectual understanding of the teaching. You can read many books and store a lot of knowledge in your brain. But if you do not understand in your own practical experience what right mindfulness is, then you will not be working in the path. You will instead be building mental formations. And this is a very subtle thing, particularly for Westerners to understand. And this is because the Western psyche is so habituated to building concepts in the mind that we mistake that for working with the consciousness. This is a huge stumbling block, and it's not something that is commonly overcome or understood. The reason for that is multiple, largely because of the mind that we have and the ego that we have. But secondly, because the traditions that we've all grown up with in the West fail to emphasize the necessity for mindfulness. There may be, for example, certain schools that know the term, that express the need for mindfulness, but they don't have the practical techniques, and they don't understand how to make mindfulness a living moment-to-moment -moment reality. And due to that misunderstanding, the students proceed to build very elaborate and quite beautiful mental formations, but fail to enter into the real work because mindfulness is not established. Truthfully, the establishing of mindfulness is a terrible challenge. It is, a, it is actually a, a very easy matter to acquire an intellectual understanding of Gnosis or of Buddhism or of Christianity or any religious or mystical school. The intellectual understanding is a child's game compared with the establishing and perfection of mindfulness. This is because the intellect in itself is actually quite simple. Even though we talk about the mind being very co complicated and very dense, which it is, the function of the intellect is really based upon a simple uh, axis of duality, which is yes and no, good or bad. And that axis forces or encourages us to formulate mental concepts based upon that very duality. And when we accept those types of formations in the mind as truth, then we automatically set ourselves up for conflict because any mental formation is equally opposed by another one. So students become locked and trapped in arguments in the mind and fail to establish real mindfulness. Mindfulness itself is beyond the intellect. It's beyond the mind. And due to this, it's more difficult to establish. It's more difficult because we have become so habituated within the mind itself, within the intellect particularly. So the interesting thing is that even a sort of superficial examination of any real scripture, 
like the Bible or the Quran or any of the sutras, we'll find a, a large number of indications that mindfulness is the very basis of the work. But as I stated, the established religions, the orthodox or sort of conventional um, powers, religious powers, fail to emphasize it. Now, if we look in the Bible, we find a quote that says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. So that in itself is an indication that vigilance, mindfulness, is the basis from which the springs of life arise. And those springs, as we know in Gnosis, are deeply symbolic. Examining that quote, meditating upon that quote, we find that from the establishment of mindfulness and vigilance comes the very development of our soul. So it's important for us to understand what is mindfulness? What is right mindfulness? What does that mean? Because also in the West, having recently encountered teachings like Buddhism and Hinduism, we have uh, absorbed a new set of terminology. And we've combined that terminology with our own Western understanding, which unfortunately has resulted in the misunderstanding of many key aspects of the spiritual path. Mindfulness is one of these concepts or words that's uh, very misunderstood in the West. So it's important for us to clarify what exactly we mean by the term mindfulness. And we should compare this with words like awareness, attention, and consciousness. Students of Gnosis study the consciousness. Students of Buddhism study the consciousness as well, but they don't use that term. They call it mind. Students of Hinduism also study the consciousness. And they have different terms for it depending on the, the particular aspect that they're examining. And to uh, decrease our confusion, I'm not going to throw a lot of terms at you. But what's essential for us to, to grasp <clears throat> is that the consciousness itself is perception. But this perception is not limited to physical senses. So when we have consciousness, we have the ability to perceive. When you look at consciousness in that way, then you can understand that all living things perceive. And so all living things have consciousness. This is something that the intellect itself can grasp rather easily. And when you look at life that way, and you look at simply the physical world, you can see that all of the creatures that are existing now are able to perceive and are therefore conscious. Now this point of view is different from the Western psychological tradition. The Western psychological tradition, in its, in its sort of orthodox point of view, believes that only human beings are conscious. But really, religion and Gnosis disagree with this, because we understand the consciousness in a very different way from the Western psychology. If all creatures are conscious, then we can understand that there are levels. There are grades of consciousness. There are different qualities, different capacities. And this is quite simple to see when you compare the ability of a plant to perceive with the ability of an animal. It's evident that a plant can perceive because plants react to physical phenomena. They react to light, they react to heat, they react to sensation of different kinds. Certain plants will react in the presence of music. 
Certain plants will react in the presence of a person. Some will react in the presence of different kinds of animals. So there is perception there, which means there is consciousness there to the level of the plant. The same is true of an animal. They have consciousness and perception in their level. And of course, we have a certain degree or a certain level of consciousness. Unfortunately, we think we have the maximum amount of available consciousness. And this is, of course, untrue. Even within the traditional materialistic science of our current day, our scientists tell us that we only use approximately 3% of the capacity of our brain. Now, the brain is simply a machine, simply a tool. But that tool is largely unused. And this is a very important factor to understand. Who or what uses that tool? And why is only 3% being utilized? This is an important thing in Gnosis for us to come to understand. That 3% is really insignificant. It's a very small percentage. It means that the largest portions of the brain are dormant. And the same we could say is true of our endocrine system which also has capacities that are largely untapped. But the question becomes, how does one use and activate these dormant portions of our simple physiology? And the answer to that comes in understanding what the consciousness is and how to use it. So, returning back to our terminology, understanding that we have consciousness developed to a certain degree, we should understand then how to use it. Firstly, to understand if we use it. Just because we have something does not mean we use it. We obviously see that's true in the case of our physical brain, if we're only using a small percentage. What about the consciousness itself? How do we use our own consciousness? In, in all likelihood, very few of us could give an exact definition to that question. And this is really a tragedy. Because the consciousness itself is our true, true inner nature. But asked to define it, who among us can really define consciousness? Asked to express its qualities, who among us can truly define the qualities of the consciousness? This is not easy to do. And yet, we believe we are conscious. So there's a little bit of a contradiction. The foundation... The fundamental starting point of any real teaching, spiritual teaching, is to comprehend what is the consciousness and how does it work. Now, of course, as I mentioned, in the Western traditions, this understanding is largely lost. You can find signs of it. Of course, quotes in the Bible, quotes in the Quran. You can find a little more information about it if you examine the tradition of Eastern Orthodox Christianity, where they have a better understanding of how the consciousness works. And there are writings from, let's say, the Desert Fathers from many hundreds of years ago where they express a clear understanding of states of consciousness that are beyond our normal, what we would call, vigil state. But, by and large, we today do not have that understanding. So right mindfulness is that science to grasp that understanding, to achieve the understanding of the consciousness itself. So we'd start talking about these terms, awareness, attention, mindfulness. If the consciousness is perception, then we can relate it to a light. And as we're all currently inhabiting our physical bodies, or at least most of us are, we can say that the perception of the consciousness is arriving through the filter of the senses. This is our starting point. The beginning of right mindfulness is in the, this very particular continual remembrance that what we perceive is sensual is filtered by these five physical senses that we have now. 
touch, taste, sight, etc. The perceptions that arise and that enter into our understanding are filtered. They're not pure. They're not complete. In Buddhism, there's a famous sutra called Satipatthana. And in that sutra, the Buddha examines and outlines the four foundations of mindfulness. And these four foundations are really the basis upon which a monk or a practitioner of Hinayana, or the lesser school of Buddhism, practices. These foundations are really the basis of their entire spiritual focus. And this is simply the awareness of the self. They begin by developing continual observation of the body. Or in other words, the senses. And you find the same technique in Hinduism. This mindfulness of the body is to be in continual awareness of the sensations that arise and which thereby transmit information into our understanding, into the consciousness itself. So in this very moment, all of us within physical bodies are receiving all types of sensory data but we are completely unaware of it. And the reason for that is we are identified with the mind. We're trapped in dualistic thinking, in comparison and in associations. So the basis, the starting point for right mindfulness is to begin to become aware of our physical presence and to seat oneself firmly within the consciousness as an observer of the body. Now this sounds, to the intellect, quite simple. The intellect says, oh yeah, that's easy. No problem. I get that. But that's not enough for me. And that's because the mind doesn't really get it. The mind itself, the intellect, is not the one who observes. It is the consciousness who observes. And this again is another point of frustration for many students. They are trying to apply the intellect as a tool for observation, and this is not possible. The, the intellect is only a tool for comparing. So when we are receiving sensations and observing ourselves, if we're comparing, we need to watch that closely. Upon what basis are we comparing? Now, there are techniques, particularly related to this tradition of Satipatthana, wherein we observe the body and we do analyze the sensations that arise. We compare the sensations based upon the simple axis of duality. Are these sensations pleasant or unpleasant? Now, properly applied, that comparison can be fruitful. But it is still using the intellect. So it is an introductory level of observation. It's worth using. We are at the introductory level of the path. And we need to take advantage of the capacities and limitations that we have now. Work within where we are. That's why the Buddha taught that technique. When observing the body, observe the sensations that arise. If you're trapped within the mind, See how the mind itself is a trap. So when a sensation comes, when you're feeling yourself sitting in a chair, observe those sensations. Are they pleasant or unpleasant? And then observe how does your mind react to that. Another simple but very effective technique, become aware of the senses themselves. For example, are you aware of your eyes? Because you are seeing. And I would say that there's probably only been a couple of times in our life that we've been aware that we have eyes. How many years have we been alive and not really realized that fact? And this is a lack of mindfulness. The application 
of that technique, to become deeply aware of how information is received by the senses, establishes a very strong foundation for mindfulness because the student activates their capacity to continually observe. Now, meditation itself is simply an extension of that capacity. And if you become frustrated with meditation, your answer is probably right here. Learn to be mindful, and meditation becomes easy. Meditation is actually an extremely simple art. What makes it difficult is our own mind. Meditation is a tool or a technique that is natural to the soul. It is natural as breathing is to the physical body. Our physical body breathes automatically. In the same way, the consciousness comprehends automatically. But with us, the mind becomes an obstacle and it gets in the way. So we begin by learning to be mindful, firstly, of the body. When that mindfulness becomes established, when we truly are making progress and being continually present within the physical body, then we are beginning to establish what we call self-observation. Self-observation is the same thing as mindfulness. In the strictest terms, to be mindful means to remember. To be mindful of what you're doing means to be aware of what you're doing, to realize that you are doing something. And of course, most of the time, we don't have that awareness. We sit in our chair, and we are not actively aware that we are sitting in a chair. We sit in the chair, and then we begin to think about other things. We begin to dream, to imagine. And this is the associative power of the dualistic mind to work with associations in order to take us out of the present moment. Be aware of that in the course of this lecture. How often does your mind come and say, oh yeah, that reminds me of this, or oh, I remember when this happened, or what if this happens, past and future? Associative thought. This is called distraction. And when those distractions arise, we become identified. Distractions can arise in any of our three brains. They can arise physically, so perhaps we have a very pleasant sensation or a very unpleasant sensation, and that distraction stimulates the mind to begin to associate with other images and ideas. And before we know it, a few minutes have gone by, and when you realize it and you come back to listening to the lecture, you have no idea what I'm talking about. And it takes you a minute to catch up. I'm sure everybody knows what I'm talking about. That is a form of hypnosis, and it's a way that our own ego, our own mind, hypnotizes the consciousness by using associative or discursive thought. Mindfulness is the first antidote to that problem. By continually remembering to be present is mindful. That's how we become mindful. And by continually manifesting that observation, we establish a continuity of consciousness. Now, people often ask, what is self-realization? What does that mean? And the basis of self-realization is continuity of consciousness. And out of that continuity arise all of the splendors of the soul. If we're distracted, if we're absorbed in discursive thought, or the dispersed mind, then we are not having continuity of consciousness. We are having dispersed consciousness, divided consciousness. Consciousness divided into different packets, into different distractions, different events. So we can say, in any given moment, we have a wide variety of thoughts and feelings and sensations which arise, all of which want our attention. And we tend to be thrown about back and forth between them. Oh, I got to do this and that. Oh, I remember this. Oh, what about that? Maybe this will happen. Maybe that'll happen. <clears throat> this is all 
very discontinuous, very chaotic, and demonstrates a lack of mindfulness. So the mindful person, the one who's establishing the practice of being present, does not resist the mind. The mindful person does not resist sensation. The mindful person observes. When a sensation arises, we look at it, and that's all. When a feeling arises, we look at it. But we are separate from it. Now, this sense of separation seems to be quite confusing to the student. But it's really simple. And it requires no intellect at all to do it. It's an effort of the will in the consciousness. And it's quite simple. If a feeling arises in your body, a sensation, you observe that. You are not that sensation. And if you observe your body right now, I'm sure you can find some sensation somewhere which is strong enough for you to observe it and to recognize in yourself right now there is a sensation happening over there in your foot, in your arm. But you, as the observer, are not that sensation. There you have established the perception of that distinction. The intellect doesn't need to interfere with that at all. So don't bring it. Just observe. Notice that when a sound happens, you observe the sound. It arises and passes away. When I say a word, I speak a sentence, it arises and it passes away. You are not those words, but you observe them. Your brain is not those words. Even the way that that information is trans translated into your understanding, that is not you. The commentary that you hear in yourself about what I'm saying is also not you. You have to keep backing up. Keep separating. And at a certain point you come to recognize that behind the senses, behind the body, behind feelings, behind thought, is pure perception. To experience that requires no book. It requires nothing but your own effort. And that experience transforms you. When you really see in yourself, in this moment, that you are a perceiver who does not require thought or feeling or sensation, you are establishing self-observation, mindfulness. And the continuity of that point of view is the basis of your interior spiritual revolution. And in the moment that you lose that and begin to think and to begin to revel in your feelings or revel in sensation, you go back to sleep. Notice how difficult it is to maintain that continuity of observation. It takes a lot of willpower and it takes a lot of effort. That is what we mean in Gnosis by right effort. And it is also what we mean in Gnosis by right view. And it is what we mean by right action. So all of the steps of the Eightfold Path are unified in right mindfulness. That Eightfold Path is one. It is the fourth noble truth. It is, and there is a way to escape suffering. And that way is by becoming conscious. Now, it's important to clarify something. Even those who learn black magic learn to be mindful. Even those who learn black tantra, who learn sorcery and witchcraft, learn to concentrate. And they learn to be mindful. So what's the difference? What do you observe? And how do you observe it? The establishing of mindfulness is critical. There's no question about that. Every scripture points towards that establishing. 
Every tradition knows and understands that mindfulness is the basis upon which we realize those truths. Black magic realizes the same thing. Those who teach wrong paths also teach how to meditate, how to concentrate, how to observe. But they teach it in a different way. The distinction is this. When we establish mindfulness, we have to separate from thinking. We have to separate from feeling. And we have to see their inherent nature. To simply, through a force of will, to develop directed attention, this is good, but it is not everything. The black magician also learns to concentrate, learns to meditate, learns to focus. And that's how they empower their works, through that force of will. But the consciousness that they learn to direct is deluded consciousness, which is trapped in pride, in anger, in fear, in envy. This is why we say we need to understand all the aspects of the Eightfold Path. Because action, that aspect, those three parts of the Eightfold Path, action is concerned with ethics. What is right and what is wrong. To concentrate is an easy matter. When we become identified with a feeling, we can concentrate very well. When someone betrays us, we have no problem thinking about that continually and focusing on that from moment to moment. When someone makes us angry, we have no problem being continually aware of that anger. So that is a form of mindfulness. It is a form of concentration, but it is wrong. The right thing to do is to be aware of those feelings, to be aware of that anger, but to separate. To recognize the consciousness does not feel anger. The free consciousness, that is. The essence. The being is not a victim of those feelings. The true inner most parts of ourselves do not become identified with those sensations and feelings. So we have to understand how to apply mindfulness. How to utilize the tools that are present within ourselves. Awareness you can say, is very similar to mindfulness. So when we get more specific with our terminology, we start looking at what is attention and what is awareness. To be mindful is sort of a general term. It means to remember what we're doing. To be continually present. In... in uh, Tibetan Buddhism, they often call this mental glue. And this term is very interesting because it, it illustrates that mindfulness is that capacity of the consciousness to hold our understanding together. What allows us to be continually aware, continually observing. It prevents the attention from forgetting about or losing the object that we observe. Attention is focused. It is directed. So we can say in this way that it's more or less like a flashlight or a laser because it's a very concentrated, very directed force. So in meditation practice, when we first learn how to concentrate, 
we take some type of object and we learn to concentrate our attention. This means we learn how to become exclusive, to focus attention exclusively on one thing. And the goal there is to develop one-pointedness, or pratyahara, or shamatha. And this one-pointedness is simply the development of attention, directed consciousness. Now, awareness is general. It's diffused. So in this moment, your attention, hopefully, is on what I'm saying. But at the same time, you can remain aware of your environment. So that's the distinction. But the third aspect is to be mindful of all of that. And that mindfulness is the mental glue. It's that remembrance from moment to moment that you're paying attention and that you're aware. So we can't use these terms interchangeably. And unfortunately, due to laziness and misunderstanding, we do. But it will help us to comprehend the teachings if we use them in the right way. So mindfulness, further defined, would be the first aspect is that it prevents the attention from forgetting. Right? Prevents forgetting. So in meditation, when we learn to concentrate, this is our first challenge. Because we continually forget what we're observing. Because the mind distracts us. So this is why in the beginning of meditation, the most important thing for us to develop is mindfulness. To remember that we are meditating. To not forget that we are meditating. Now, this takes effort, because in the beginning, the student takes their object of observation, observes it, and within a few moments is thinking about something else, is dreaming, forgets that they're supposed to be meditating, and maybe 15, 20 minutes back and says, oh, I'm supposed to be meditating. I forgot. The antidote is mindfulness. What that event illustrates is that that student is not mindful during the day. That student is distracted all day long by thinking, by feelings. So the student is then advised to become mindful in the course of the day, to be aware of what one is doing at all times. And a good practice for that is do one thing at a time. Do one thing at a time. Do it with great attention, great care, and you will develop mindfulness. The second aspect of mindfulness is that it holds the attention on the object with endurance. And again, we need this in meditation. In order to really comprehend anything, any phenomena, we must hold the attention on it. But if we don't have mindfulness, that is the continual remembrance of what we're doing, then the attention becomes distracted by thoughts, by memories, but desires. So not only does mindfulness prevent the forgetting, but it needs to establish the endurance to withstand the distractions of the mind. Now, in the third aspect of mindfulness is to maintain a continuity of familiarity. And what this means is that as you're observing a given thing, to be mindful is to be aware of what else you've seen. Now this is particularly important in meditation. Because when you meditate, you need to have the awareness, the mindfulness, that when a thought arises, you've seen that thought before. We don't have that right now, and that's why I become so distracted. This is also true all day long. We fail to realize that most of the thoughts we've had today we had yesterday, the majority. Most of the feelings that we've had today, we had the day before. But because we're not mindful, we don't realize that we're constantly repeating the same sensations, the same thoughts, and the same feelings. But with the application of mindfulness, we start to recognize that. 
And then those same thoughts, those same feelings, and those same sensations become a stimulant for awareness. This is the first step of how we learn to use the mind against itself. With mindfulness, we begin to see the mechanicity of the mind. So when a thought arises, the mindfulness remembers, I have seen that thought before. And we can immediately separate and not be identified. That produces comprehension. So concentration is built upon this basis. True concentration. Concentration is really attention made very strong. We all have the ability to pay attention to a certain degree. Maybe not for very long. It seems that ADD or attention deficient disorder is becoming extremely widespread in these times. And that's because of the nature of the mind that we are cultivating. Our media, our lifestyle, encourages us to be very distracted, to not have continuity of attention. And so we get bored really fast. We lose the ability to maintain interest in any given thing because we're so identified with receiving new sensations all the time. So we hear a lecture and we say, oh, I've already heard this lecture. I don't need to hear it again. This is wrong. If you really knew the contents of the lecture, you would be awake. It's simple. The consciousness needs to learn. And the consciousness learns through directed attention. The mind flourishes in distraction. And the mind is the basis of suffering. So to transcend suffering, we have to disempower the mind. And that's only possible by taking the consciousness out of it. We do that by establishing mindfulness and attention. So attention focused, disciplined, becomes concentration. Concentration is the method by which we comprehend. And comprehension, which is not a capacity of the intellect, it is a capacity of the consciousness or the soul. Comprehension is the basis of spiritual development. It is the understanding of right and wrong. It is the understanding of the Eightfold Path, of right action. It is the understanding of suffering. So to reach the understanding of suffering has nothing to do with the mind in terms of the mind being active. It has to do with the comprehension of that mind. You cannot comprehend the mind with the mind. The eye cannot fix the eye. There are some Gnostic students who have the mistaken idea that you cannot comprehend the ego in samadhi or in meditation. Samadhi or the ecstasy that we reach through meditation, is the absence of the I. Samadhi is the experience of the consciousness becoming completely free of the ego. Even if it's only a small consciousness, a 3%, let's say. But when that essence is extracted from the ego, it experiences an ecstasy, bliss. This is not a sensation. This is a complete experience of all the potential senses of the consciousness. It's visual. It has sound. It has heat. It has light. And it's only when we are free from the eye that we can truly comprehend the eye. Because while we're trapped within the ego, we cannot see it. We cannot really comprehend it. So the escape from the mind, the escape from the ego, is the basis of comprehension. And that is called samadhi. To reach samadhi is based upon directed attention and concentration, which are in turn based upon mindfulness. So again we return to how important mindfulness is in our practice. To really develop 
the capacity of mindfulness, we have to see in ourselves why we are not mindful. And this is a matter of practice. This is why we call it self-observation. Because the term mindfulness is sort of a little bit vague. It's not quite specific enough. But when we use the term self-observation, that's quite clear. We need to watch ourselves continually. And in that watchfulness, we need to be looking for something specific. We need to look for why we are not watchful. So we actually have to turn the consciousness back towards itself. And this stimulates growth. When you start to see, you pay attention to how you pay attention, then you realize how you pay attention. When you become mindful of how you are mindful, then you can really understand mindfulness. But simply trying to observe outwardly, continually, is extremely difficult. So use this trick. Become aware of how you are aware. Observe how you observe. And you will make rapid progress. You will understand much. And what you will find is that your observation, your powers of observation, are continually being knocked out of the way by discursive thinking, by a dispersed mind, by desires, memories, fantasies, fears, pride. To be mindful, truly mindful, is effortless. And I know that can sound like a contradiction. The effort is in the consciousness. If you're becoming tense, you're doing it wrong. And this is another clue. Mindfulness is something based upon relaxation. Relax. From moment to moment, relax, relax, relax. Tension is produced in the mind. When the mind is tense, the mind is in conflict, the body becomes tense. So relax the body and observe the mind. The monk or the nun or the practitioner, when they learn satipatthana, this technique of mindfulness, they start with observing the body and relaxing the body continually. And the Master Samael and Vyor wrote quite clearly, I relax myself continually from moment to moment. So self-observation is based upon relaxation, and so is meditation. Tension is an obstacle, and tension is produced in the mind by conflict, by desires which conflict with reality. So we relax, we observe the body. With the establishment of that mindfulness of the body, we begin to look deeper, we begin to observe our feelings, we begin to observe our thoughts. There's a practice that's often taught in conjunction with these techniques. And in uh, the, the Pali language, they call it anapatasati. And really this is just mindfulness of breath, to observe breathing. It's a very common technique. It's a very effective technique. So if you study any kind of Hinayana Buddhism, the, the part of the lesser vehicle, and in fact, in, in many of the schools of Mahayana, they teach this technique. It's also known in Christianity. It's known in Islam. It's also known in Gnosis. The basis upon which Anapatvasati works is to be continually mindful of the process of breathing. And the reason for this practice, or the effectiveness of this practice, is that it is not based in any idea. It is not any kind of concept or thought. When you observe the breath, you do not observe the idea of breathing. 
You don't even observe the emotional quality of breathing. You observe the simple fact of it. And you observe that it never is the same. So this practice yields great benefit. When you truly are mindful of breath, you come to grasp consciously that everything is impermanent. That all the sensations that are arising and passing away are subject to the wheel of life and death. And when you see sensation, physical sensation, arising and passing, that mindfulness expands and you see the same phenomena in your emotions. And then you begin to realize this fear that I have arises and passes. It's not permanent. So why am I so identified with it? This pride that I feel is impermanent. And why am I so identified with it? This desire to have something is impermanent. Because when I get it, I'm happy for a moment, and then I lose that happiness. The sensation passes, or I lose the object of my affection, and then I suffer. Why become attached? That observation, the mindfulness of that impermanence, is a very powerful catalyst to help us transform the way we receive impressions and the way we act. So mindfulness of breath is very effective. But we cannot stop with mindfulness of breath. Practitioners of the Hinayana schools often do just that. Unfortunately, they believe, some believe, that by being mindful of breath, they establish concentration, and upon the basis of that concentration, they will become self-realized as a matter of course. And this is wrong. Self-realization is acquired through comprehension, through comprehending the inherent nature of all phenomena. And that begins inside of oneself, to see the inherent nature of sensation, of feeling, and thought. In the Mahayana schools, they take this practice a little deeper. They observe the sensations, they observe the brain, they observe, I mean, the, the body, they observe the feelings, they observe the thoughts. But they observe them all from the point of view of emptiness. And this is the real difference in the Mahayana schools, the greater vehicle. They observe that the feeling that arises in its basis doesn't exist. It arises and passes. It has no real existence. It's conditioned. It's dependent on other factors. So why be identified with it? And upon that basis, they begin to recognize that there is no self. There is no ego. There is no I. The practice of mindfulness begins to point that out to us in a very clear way. You observe you're in a difficult situation and someone is criticizing you. And when you observe yourself very carefully, you notice that it is an ego. It is one part of the mind which is reacting to the criticism. But you, as the observer, if you remain separate from those feelings, you recognize those feelings are an illusion. They aren't real. But unfortunately, in the past, I've always mistaken them for being me. And when that experience arises, through the application of mindfulness, where you can see that you as a consciousness are not anger, the realization arises that the I is not real. The consciousness is real. The I is not. But because we believe the I is real, and we grasp on to this sense of self, we suffer. So simply by applying this basic technique of mindfulness, we can arise these understandings in ourselves and really comprehend why we ourselves are suffering. In uh, the Dhammapada, which is one of the most important scriptures in the tradition of Buddhism, we find that uh, it's recorded 
that the Buddha said this, heedfulness is the path to the deathless. Heedlessness is the path to death. The heedful do not die. The heedless are like unto the dead. So this relates closely to things that the Master Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. The meaning there is that how do we define ourselves as a consciousness? Are we listening to the mind? Are we obeying the desires and impulses of the ego? And the answer is quite evident when we observe ourselves. When we really observe ourselves, we observe those sensations and desires. Do we heed them? Do we listen to them? Do we follow them? The one who does not observe is always being pulled by the ego, by the eye, by desire. And so that one is truly spiritually dead in terms of being dead to spirit, dead to truth. We need to be dead to the ego. And that death begins with mindfulness. That separation. More on mindfulness can be found in another sutra from Buddhism where the Buddha wrote or said, and it was recorded, if while going, standing, sitting, or reclining when awake, a thought of sensuality, hatred, or aggressiveness arises, and he tolerates it, does not reject, discard, and eliminate it, does not bring it back to an end. That one who in such a manner is ever and again lacking in earnest endeavor and moral shame is called indolent and void of energy. Now this, of course, is all of us. Because we do listen to our aggressive thoughts. We do succumb to our hatred. We do indulge in thoughts of sensuality. And we do embrace and enjoy the thoughts and feelings of our envy and our pride. But if, while going, standing, sitting, or reclining, a thought of sensuality, hatred, or aggressiveness arises, and he does not tolerate it, but rejects, discards, and eliminates it, brings it to an end, that one who in such a manner ever and again shows earnest endeavor and moral shame is called energetic and resolute. The capacity and ability to change is based in mindfulness. We have to be aware of the thoughts and feelings that arise in order to change them. It's quite simple. If we do not establish continual awareness of ourselves, we cannot establish a basis for change. And this is where, unfortunately, many spiritual practitioners fail. Many believe. Many build concepts. Many have what they call faith. Many belong to groups. They pay their fines or dues. They go to church or they go to temple. They participate in different kinds of activities and they consider themselves to be pious. But they do not observe their own mind. They are not changing. And upon that, there is no true entrance into the path. The Jesus, Master Jesus said, Ye must be perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. And he also said many times in many different ways that we cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven if we are adulterers, fornicators, murderers. And he said, Murder is not simply the act of physically killing we kill with a word. Adultery is not the physical act. We adulterate with a thought. If we're not observing our thoughts and feelings, we cannot change them. And so we remain in sin. And we remain in suffering. And we remain continuing in mistaken behaviors. And of course, that generates more karma and more suffering. It's essential that we make the, tr the techniques and the understandings of Gnosis very practical. We need to observe. We need to be mindful. That mindfulness or self-observation has to be added with an additional factor. 
And this is something that marks Gnosis as being different. We can look at most religions and see self-observation called different names, right? What makes Gnosis different? What makes this, this particular teaching different? Self-remembering. We need to understand what that means. Mindfulness or self-observation is remembering to be present. It's remembering to be here and now. It's remembering and being aware of what we're doing. It is not self-remembering. The term self-remembering refers to the real self. In the books of Samael and Vior, we see the term self-remembering written many times. And we notice this. But we often fail to realize or recognize the importance of a little word that's usually right before this phrase, the word inner. And even when we read this inner self-remembering, we think of it as self-remembering within ourselves. Inner self-remembering. And this is true, but that's really mindfulness. The phrase is better understood as inner self remembering, to remember the inner self, to remember God. This is what distinguishes Gnosis. What is the inner self? How do we remember that which is within? If we're not mindful, we can't remember him. We can't remember that inner self because we're not present. We're distracted. But even if we're mindful, we often don't remember that we have inside of ourselves a connection to divinity. So to observe oneself and be mindful is something anyone can learn. Even the black magicians learn that. Even people who are performing black magic learn to be mindful. But they do not remember the inner self. And that's why they're in black magic. The distinguishing characteristic from white to black is the recognition, respect, and service of divinity. The black magician simply seeks to serve his own will. And he calls that will divine, and he may call it God. He may call it the guardian of the threshold. He may call it Atman. He may call it anything that he wants. But if it is his will, it is diabolic. May thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy is the inner self. Thy is our real being who is far beyond the I. He is the self who has nothing to do with our false self. The inner being, or the innermost, is the source from which our essence springs. In Christianity, they call him the Father. In Hinduism, they have different names. Brahma, even Atman, can be used. In Buddhism, they have a vastly complicated way of perceiving this inner self. But in essence, they say the self is empty, which is true. They say the self does not exist, which in a sense is true. But this inner self is really our true nature. And it is devoid of what we think of as self. And that is why Buddhism and Gnosis agree there is no self. We say there is an inner self, but we also say there is no self. How do you resolve that? Through experience, through comprehension. Then you understand. This inner self is the channel or source of the energy which illuminates the soul. So to be mindful is essential. 
But we need to combine that with the remembrance or awareness of our inner divinity. Not the I. And this remembrance, if it's true, comes with humility and a sense of repentance. Many people say, I remember my inner God. But they say it with pride. This is false. This is ego. Many people say, my inner being is the master so-and-so. My inner being is a great logos. And I am his Dhyani Bodhisattva. This is pride. This is not self-remembering. Self-remembering is a quality that is so precious and so humble and so pure, it cannot even say the word I. Cannot even say it. Because in the presence of that inner divinity, we see that we are nothing. We are insignificant. Less than dust. And this is not just a theory. This is not just a pretty or poetic idea. It is a terrible fact. We have too much pride. That's why we suffer. Real self-remembering is humility. It is the absence of I and the presence of the divine. When the I becomes cleared out and removed, then God can enter. And, but the I can only be removed when we are aware of it. If you don't see the I, you can't remove it. So you have to be very mindful. In the Bible, we find some very good instructions related to mindfulness. But on first glance, it may not appear to be related to mindfulness. But if you look in the book of Proverbs, you will discover that the bulk or the, the mass of this beautiful book is really related to mindfulness. This uh, selection of writings is attributed to Solomon, the great wise king. And it's a selection of chapters wherein the father expresses to the son how to become wise. We need to understand that the father in this case is the inner self, is that divinity who's expressing to his son, us, how to achieve the work. So we see here in book two, my son, if you accept my words and treasure up my commandments, if you make your ear attentive to wisdom and your mind open to discernment, if you call to understanding and cry aloud to discernment, if you seek it as you do silver and search for it as for treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and attain knowledge of God. Do you notice that in that passage is repeated attention, discernment? That's mindfulness. The emphasis here is to be aware to learn how to discern one thing from another. And he says quite clearly, if you do this, if you seek for this discernment and understanding, you will attain the fear of the Lord and attain knowledge of God. Knowledge, of course, is gnosis. It is that, the hidden sphere of the Kabbalah. And that knowledge is the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, and the knowledge of the path in order to return back to our lost state of purity. If you call to understanding, is of course to call to Bina, the Holy Spirit, which is of course that fire which illuminates the tree. Discernment is, cap is possible only with conscious attention, with mindfulness. A little bit later, in the same book, we also find a line that is important. It's in book four, 23. He says, more than all that you guard, guard your mind 
for it is the source of life. Right there is the biblical exposition of the importance of mindfulness. Now, I read earlier the same quote, but translated in another, ver another version of the Bible, where it said, guard your heart. And I think that the combination of those two translations yields some interesting understanding. Because truly, to be mindful is to be mindful of the heart and mind. To be mindful of our entire psyche. In Buddhism, we find another great quote which says, Even those who have much learning, faith, and willing perseverance will become defiled by a moral fall due to the mistake of lacking alertness. The thieves of unalertness and following upon the decline of mindfulness will steal even the merits I have firmly gathered. I shall then descend to the lower realms. Mindfulness, attentiveness, self-observation, and self-remembering are the essence, the spine of Gnosis. Many students enter into these studies. They hurriedly consume the intellectual doctrine. And they fail to grasp the practical realities of the teaching. They may have a great intellectual understanding. They may have great passion, great faith, great devotion. But without mindfulness, they have nothing. Without the development of conscious attention, they have no way to enter into the real teaching. And so they remain outside. Now, unfortunately, in these days, there are many like this who are teachers. There are many in, in different spiritual groups around the world who teach beautifully but have no true understanding, no comprehension of the teaching. And it's because they have not truly understood how to make that teaching practical and how to develop conscious attention and mindfulness in themselves. It's essential that we work on a continual basis to be mindful. But simple mindfulness is not enough. That mindfulness must be accompanied by the remembrance of our inner self. The recognition that we have fallen into error and we must change in order to come out of it. If we simply develop the will to be attentive and disciplined and we do not bring with that the remembrance of the divine, we're walking on the wrong path. To develop self-will is to develop in the wrong way. So mindfulness is, is very important. It's the basis of the Eightfold Path. But it has to be performed in the right way. It has to be practiced. It has to be investigated. Any questions? self-observation as, as you mentioned it was a you have to be actively aware but I think so many people think it means to like focus like they, they get stressed out with or tension in the intellect or something yeah it's like you have to be passive to the way you usually are to be active to the yeah that's a good way of putting it you have to be passive to the way you usually are so your normal way of being has to become passive and if your normal way of being is very active, you're not doing it. It's a good way of putting it. You can observe in yourself and in other people the personality. The personality is, of course, the face that we use to get through life. If that personality is active, the consciousness is asleep. This is a very important distinguishing factor. We need to always be aware of how our personality is working. And if that personality is 
giddy, excited, expressive, or depressed and angry and upset, where is the consciousness? This creates great discomfort for the student because in the beginning it feels like we don't know who we are. We begin to become confused, even afraid. And unfortunately, there are some who don't have the strength to withstand that fear. So they leave these studies in search of something easier. And it's unfortunate. Because they're really they're running away from their own selves. And you can't do that. You are what you are and you carry it with you until you change it. It's better to be very sincere and to see it's true. You are not who you think you are. And so long as you think you are who you think you are, you're wrong thinking. You're trapped in wrong thought, wrong understanding. The willingness to see that we are not what we think we are, and we are, in fact, what we don't want to be, takes courage. And that's why the Master Samael and Vior said, we have to first unbecome what we are in order to become what we should be. And in the beginning, this is very difficult. We th tend to think that we can take what we are and just make it better and go to heaven. <clears throat> but what we are cannot go to heaven. What we are takes us to exactly where we are, which is trapped in suffering. To e escape suffering, to transcend pain, to transcend uncertainty and fear, means we have to unbecome what keeps us in that state. You have to not be what you are to become what you are not. When the Bible states that we don't have to have any image of, of God, what has that to do with remembering God? Okay. The question is that when the Bible says we should not have any image of God, what does that have to do with the remembrance of God? To remember God does not require an image. And truly, when that statement is made in the Old Testament, that is referring to the ultimate aspect or the, the highest parts of the tree of life, which truly have no image. There is no image that can represent the absolute. Yet God enters into form, and form has an image. So you have to understand it in context with the tree of life. You cannot make an image of the Absolute, but you can make an image of an aspect of God or an embodiment or manifestation of God. So in the same way, we may have an idea or a mental picture of what God is, but God is not limited to that. Someone from India, or who is a practitioner of Hinduism, pictures God as Shiva and worships that image and that understanding. But that is not all God is. Someone in Christianity worships God as Jesus. And truly, God entered into that vehicle. But that is not all that God is. In the same way, within ourselves, we begin to approach God. And we use images. But we have to always remember, God is more than that. The image is a vehicle. The image is a doorway. Same thing in Tantric Buddhism. They use visualization and imagery as doorways to access different parts of the consciousness. So the Tantric Buddhists learn to visualize and imagine a deity. And the practitioner imagines themselves becoming one with that deity. And then learns to imagine seeing through the eyes of that deity as if they were that deity. And this becomes a, a way of seeing the ego for what it is. Nothing. But none of that means 
that we have made an image of God to worship that image. It's a vehicle towards understanding. So self-remembering is really the same. We have to use it as a step towards understanding. Yes? When we remember God, what sphere of the tree of life do we remember? So the question is, what sphere of the tree of life do we remember God in? God is not limited to a sphere. Truly, God is in everything. To remember God is to realize every atom of your body is illuminated by Him. You see because of the fire that He gives to your senses. And that fire gives the capacity for the perception of imagery. And you hear because the fire of God, that intelligence, is within the auditory systems that feed those vibrations into your brain. It's not a matter of saying, I'm remembering this mental idea I have of Atman, who's in the sphere of Chesed. No. It's remembering God in yourself. Why are you alive? How are you alive? Have you considered the miracle of your body? Have you considered the incomprehensible nature of perception itself? If you observe that, you begin to approach what I'm pointing towards. You cannot limit the self-remembering of God to a mental picture or a concept. It has to be practical. It has to be in the moment. What are you experiencing right now, and how is God behind that? If you're observing your mind, and you see anger, you see pride, or you see fear, is God behind that? If you're observing yourself, and you're observing how you observe, where is God? Do you feel that? Do you feel God when you're angry? How do you remember what you do not know? These are questions to ask yourself. And through that type of questioning, you stimulate your consciousness to reach out. To not be limited by the concepts of your mind. By a mental picture, even of the tree of life. God is not limited to the tree. He is the tree. Your consciousness is not limited to the tree. It is the tree itself. When you remember God, you are trying to understand and perceive your own conscious nature. That is self-remembering. To feel and perceive directly right now. How is it that God is manifesting right now? Are you aware that God is within everything? That is self-remembering. To be mindful is simply to be aware of what's going on. To be self-remembering is to be looking for the divinity behind phenomena. And that's why we say all inherent existence is empty. That emptiness is the absolute. And that is right view. Right view is the point of view that says these manifestations, these phenomena, these events that arise and pass are empty. Their inherent nature is the absolute, which has no image. That is self-remembering, and that is right view. But to say, I have my Atman, I have my inner father, and he looks like this and that, and he wears this color of robe, and he has a big crown, and this and that, that is not self-remembering, that is a mental picture. And it's fine, you can use that. But go past that. Reach beyond that. Look into the inherent nature of phenomena. Then you will begin to access the direct experience of what God is. If you build a mental picture, you will stop right there. So you can say that all the spheres represent different aspects of the being. That's correct. The tree of life is a map of the consciousness itself. The tree of life is a map of the being. The being has many parts, not one, not two, many. 
Samael and Vior has stated, the being is like an army of children. It's a huge collection of different parts that are one, ultimately. But the work of self-realization is to unify all those parts completely. That is to become a Paramartha Satya, to have absolute consciousness of all of the parts of the being. And unfortunately, right now, we don't have consciousness of any of the parts of the being. We are a part of that. We don't even have consciousness of ourselves. 